Hi and welcome. I'm Mary, a librarian at the Claremont Branch Library, and I'm glad to have you joining me today for our second to last reading of Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz by L. Frank Baum. Today is chapter 17 and 18, and yesterday we read about Dorothy and all her friends making it to the Emerald City with the use of Ozma's magic belt. And as all the friends were reunited, old friends from Oz came to greet Dorothy and the wizard. Ozma made the wizard the official Wizard of Oz, and she got prepared a wonderful breakfast for all our friends. And that's where we're going to pick it up here in Chapter 17. So let's see what happens in today's reading. Chapter 17, The Nine Tiny Piglets After breakfast, Ozma announced that she had ordered a holiday to be observed throughout the Emerald City in honor of her visitors. The people had learned that their old wizard had returned to them, and all were anxious to see him again, for he had always been a rare favorite. So first there was to be a grand procession through the streets, after which the little old man was requested to perform some of his wizardries in the great throne room of the palace. In the afternoon there were to be games and races. The procession was very imposing. First came the Imperial Cornet Band of Oz, dressed in emerald velvet uniforms with slashes of pea-green stain, satin, and buttons of immense cut dime emeralds. They played the national air called the Oz Spangled Banner, and behind them were the standard bearers of the royal flag. This flag was divided into four quarters, one being colored sky blue, another pink, a third lavender, and a fourth white. In the center was a large green, emerald green star, and all over the four quarters were sewn spangles that glittered beautifully in the sunshine. The colors represented the four countries of Oz, and the green star, the Emerald City. Just behind the royal standard bearers came Princess Ozma in her royal chariot, which was of gold encrusted with emeralds and diamonds set in exquisite designs. The chariot was drawn on this occasion by the Cowardly Lion and the Hungry Tiger, who were decorated with immense pink and blue bows. In the chariot rode Ozma and Dorothy, the former in splendid raiment and wearing her royal coronet, while the little Kansas girl wore around her waist the magic belt she had once, once captured from the Gnome King. Following the chariot came the Scarecrow, mounted on the sawhorse and the people cheered him almost as loudly as they did their lovely ruler. Behind him, stalked with regular, jerky steps, the famous machine man called Tick-Tock, who had been wound up by Dorothy for the occasion. Tick-Tock moved by clockwork and was made all of burnished copper. He really belonged to the Kansas girl, who had much respect for his thoughts after they had been properly wound and set going. But as the copper man would be useless in any place but a fairy country, Dorothy had left him in charge of Ozma, who saw that he was suitably cared for. There followed another band after this, which was called the Royal Court Band, because the members all lived in the palace. They wore white uniforms with real diamond buttons, and played What is Oz Without Ozma very sweetly. Then came Professor Wogglebug, with a group of students from the Royal College of Scientific Athletics. The boys wore long hair and striped sweaters and yelled their college yell every other step they took, to the great satisfaction of the populace, which was glad to have this evidence that their lungs were in good condition. And brilliantly polished tin woodmen marched next at the head of the Royal Army of Oz, which consisted of 28 officers, from generals down to captains. There were no privates in the army, because all were so courageous and skillful that they had been prompted one by one until they had been promoted one by one until there were no privates left. Jim and the buggy followed, the old cab horse being driven by Zeb, while the wizard stood up on the seat and bowed his bald head right and left in answer to the cheers of the people who crowded thick about him. Taken all together, the procession was a grand success, 
and when it had returned to the palace, the citizens crowded into the great throne room to see the wizard perform his tricks. The first thing the little humbug did was to produce a tiny white piglet from underneath his hat and to pretend to pull it apart, making two. This act he repeated until all of the nine tiny piglets were visible, and they were so glad to get out of his pocket that they ran around in a very lively manner. The pretty little creatures would have been a novelty anywhere, so the people were as amazed and delighted at their appearance as even the wizard could have desired. When he had made them all disappear again, Ozma declared that she was sorry they were gone, for she wanted one of them to pet and play with. So the wizard pretended to take one of the piglets out of the hair of the princess, while really he slyly took it from his inside pocket, and Ozma smiled joyously at the, as the creature nestled in her arms, and she promised to have an emerald collar made for its fat neck to keep it a little the little squealer always had to, and to keep the little squealer always at hand to amuse her. Afterward, it was noticed that the wizard always performed his famous trick with eight piglets, but it seemed to please the people just as well as if there had been nine of them. In his little back room, in the throne room, the wizard had found a lot of things he had left behind him when he went away in the balloon, for no one had occupied the apartment in his absence. There was enough material there to enable him to prepare several new tricks which he had learned from some of the jugglers in the circus, and he had passed part of the night in getting them ready. So he followed the trick of the nine tiny piglets with several other, other wonderful feats that greatly delighted his audience, and the people did not seem to care a bit whether the little man was a humbug wizard or not, so, he, so long as he succeeded in amusing them. They applauded all his tricks, and at the end of the performance begged him earnestly not to go away again and leave them. In that case, said the little man gravely, I will cancel all of my engagements before the crowned heads of Europe and America, and devote myself to the people of Oz, for I love you all so well that I can deny you nothing. After the people had been dismissed with this promise, our friends joined Princess Ozma at an elaborate luncheon in the palace, where even the tiger and the lion were sumptuously fed and Jim the cab horse ate his oatmeal out of a golden bowl with seven rows of rubies, sapphires, and diamonds set around the rim. In the afternoon, they all went to a great field outside the city gates where the games were to be held. There was a beautiful canopy for Ozma and her guests to sit under and watch the people run races and jump and wrestle. You may be sure that the folks of Oz did their best with such a distinguished company watching them. And finally, Zeb offered to wrestle with the little munchkin who seemed to be the champion. In appearance, he was twice as old as Zeb, for he had long pointed whiskers and wore a peaked hat with little bells all around the brim of it, which tinkled gaily as he moved. But although the munchkin was hardly tall enough to come to Zeb's shoulder, he was so strong and clever that he laid the boy three times on his back with apparent ease. Zeb was greatly astonished at his defeat, and when the pretty princess joined her people in laughing at him, he proposed a boxing match with the munchkin, to which the little Ozite readily agreed. But the first time that Zeb managed to give him a sharp box on the ears, the munchkin sat down upon the ground and cried until the tears ran down his whiskers, because he had been hurt. This made Zeb laugh in turn and the boy felt comforted to find that Ozma laughed as merrily at her weeping subject as she had at him. Just then, the scarecrow proposed a race between the sawhorse and the cab horse, and although all the others were delighted at the suggestion, the sawhorse drew back, saying, Such a race would not be fair. Of course not, added Jim with a touch of scorn. Those little wooden legs of yours are not half as long as my own. It isn't that, said the horse modestly, but I never tire, and you do. Bah, cried Jim, looking with great disdain at the other. Do you imagine for an instant that such a shabby imitation of a horse as you can run as fast as I? I don't know, I'm sure, replied the sawhorse. 
That's what we are trying to find out, remarked the Scarecrow. The object of a race is to see who can win it, or at least that is what my excellent brain thinks. Once, when I was young, said Jim, I was a racehorse and defeated all who dared run against me. I was born in Kentucky, you know, where all the best and most arist aristocratic horses come from. But you are old now, Jim, suggested Zeb. Old? Why, I feel like a colt today, replied Jim. I only wish there was a real horse here for me to race with. I'd show the people a fine sight, I can tell you. Then why not race with the sawhorse? inquired the scarecrow. He's afraid, said Jim. Oh no, answered the sawhorse. I merely said it wasn't fair. But if my friend the real horse is willing to undertake the race, I am quite ready. So they unharnessed Jim and took the saddle off the sawhorse, and the two queerly matched animals were stood side by side for a start. When I say go, Zeb called to them, you must dig out and race until you reach those three trees you see over yonder. Then circle around them and come back again. The first one that passes the place where a princess sits shall be named the winner. Are you ready? I suppose I ought to give the wooden dummy a good start of me, growled Jim. Never mind that, said the sawhorse. I'll do the best I can. Go, cried Zeb, and at the word the two horses leapt forward and the race was begun. Jim's big hoofs pounded away at the rate, great race, rate, and although he did not look graceful, he ran in a way to do credit to his Kentucky breeding. But the sawhorse was swifter than the wind. Its wooden legs moved so fast that their twinkling could scarcely be seen, and although so much smaller than the cab horse, it covered the ground much faster. Before they had reached the trees, the sawhorse was far ahead, and the wooden animal returned to the starting place and was being lustily cheered by the Ozites before Jim came panting up to the canopy where the princess and her friends were seated. I am sorry to record the fact that Jim was not only ashamed of his defeat, but for a moment lost control of his temper. As he looked at the comical face of the sawhorse, he imagined that the creature was laughing at him. So in a fit of unreasonable anger, he turned around and made a vicious kick that sent his rival tumbling head over heels upon the ground and broke off one of its legs and its left ear. An instant later, the tiger crouched and launched its huge body through the air, swift and resistless as a ball from a cannon. The beast struck Jim full on his shoulder and sent the astonished cab horse rolling over and over amid shouts of delight from the spectators, who had been horrified by the ungracious act he had been guilty of. When Jim came to himself and sat upon his haunches, he found the cowardly lion crouched on one side of him and the hungry tiger on the other, and their eyes were glowing like balls of fire. "'I beg your pardon, I'm sure,' said Jim meekly. "'I was wrong to kick the sawhorse, and I am sorry I became angry at him. He has won the race and won it fairly. But what can a horse of flesh do against a tireless beast of wood? Hearing this apology, the tiger and the lion stopped lashing their tails and retreated with dignified steps to the side of the princess. No one must injure one of our friends in our presence, growled the lion, and Zeb ran to Jim and whispered that unless he controlled his temper in the future, he would probably be torn to pieces. Then the tin woodman cut a straight and strong limb from a tree with his gleaming axe and made a new leg and a new ear for the sawhorse. And when they had been securely fastened in place, Princess Ozma took the cornet from her own head and placed it upon the winner of the race. She said, My friend, I reward you for your swiftness by proclaiming you prince of horses, whether of wood or of flesh, and hereafter all other horses, in the land of Oz at least, must be considered imitations, and you the real champion of your race. There was more applause at this, and then Ozma had the jeweled saddle replaced upon the sawhorse, saw and she herself rode the victor back to the city at the head of the grand procession. I ought to be a fairy, grumbled Jim as he slowly drew the buggy home. 
for to be just an ordinary horse in a fairy country is to be of no account whatsoever. It's no place for us, Seb. It's lucky we got here, though, said the boy, and Jim thought of the dark cave and agreed with him. Chapter 18 The Trial of Eureka the Kitten Several days of festivity and merrymaking followed, for such old friends did not often meet, and there was much to be told and talked over between them, and many amusements to be enjoyed in this delightful country. Ozma was happy to have Dorothy beside her, for girls of her own age with whom it was proper for the princess to associate with were very few, and often the youthful ruler of Oz was lonely for lack of companionship. It was the third morning after Dorothy's arrival, and she was sitting with Ozma and their friends in a reception room, talking over old times, when the princess said to her maid, Please, go to my boudoir, Jellia, and get the white piglet I left on the dressing table. I want to play with it. Jellia at once departed on the errand, and she was gone so long that they had almost forgotten the mission, when the green-robed maiden returned with a troubled face. The piglet is not there, your highness, she said. Not there, exclaimed Ozma. Are you sure? I have hunted in every part of the room, the maid replied. Was not the door closed? asked for the princess. Yes, your highness, I am sure it was, for when I opened it, Dorothy's white kitten crept out and ran up the stairs. Hearing this, Dorothy and the wizard exchanged startled glances for they remembered how often Eureka had longed to eat a piglet. The little girl jumped up at once. Come, Ozma, she said anxiously. Let us go ourselves and search for the piglet. So the two went to the dressing room of the princess and searched carefully in every corner and among the vases and baskets and ornaments that stood about the pretty room. But not a trace could they find of the tiny creature that they sought. Dorothy was nearly weeping by this time, while Aunt Ozma was angry and indig indignant. indignant. When they returned to the others, the princess said, There is little doubt in my mind that the pretty piglet has been eaten by that horrid kitten, and if that is true, the offender must be punished. I don't believe Eureka would do such a dreadful thing, cried Dorothy, much distressed. Go and get my kitten, please, Jellia, and we'll hear what she has to say about it. The green maiden hastened away, but presently returned and said, The kitten will not come. She threatened to scratch my eyes out if I touched her. Where is she? asked Dorothy. Under the bed in your own room, was the reply. So Dorothy ran to her room and found the kitten under the bed. Come here, Eureka, she said. I won't, answered the kitten in a surly voice. Oh, Eureka, why are you so bad? The kitten did not reply. If you don't come to me right away, continued Dorothy, getting provoked, I'll take my magic belt and wish you in the country of the Gurgles. Why do you want me? asked Eureka, disturbed by this threat. You must go to Princess Ozma. She wants to talk to you. All right, returned the kitten, creeping out. I'm not afraid of Ozma or anyone else. Dorothy carried her in her arms back to where the others sat in grieved and thoughtful silence. Tell me, Eureka said the princess gently. Did you eat my pretty piglet? I won't answer for such a shoo foolish question, asserted Eureka with a snarl. Oh, yes, you will, dear, declared, declared Dorothy. The piglet is gone, and you ran out of the room when Jellia opened the door. So if you are innocent, Eureka, you must tell the princess how you came to be in her room, and what has become of the piglet. Who accuses me? asked the kitten defiantly. No one answered Ozma. Your actions alone accuse you. The fact is that I left my little pet in my dressing room, lying asleep upon the table, and you must have stolen in without my knowing it. When next the door was opened, you ran out and hid yourself, and the piglet was gone. That's none of my business, growled the kitten. Don't be impudent, Eureka, admonished Dorothy. It is you who are impudent, said Eureka, for accusing me of such a crime when you can't prove it except by guessing. Oswa was now greatly incensed by the kitten's conduct. She summoned her captain general, and when the long, lean officer appeared, she said, 
carry this cat away to prison and keep her in safe confinement until she is tried by law for the crime of murder. So the Captain General took Eureka from the arms of the now weeping Dorothy and in spite of the kitten's snarls and scratches, carried it away to prison. What shall we do now? asked the Scarecrow with a sigh, for such a crime had cast a gloom all over the company. I will summon the court to meet the th in the throne room at three o'clock, replied Ozma. I myself will be the judge, and the kitten shall have a fair trial. What will happen if she is guilty? asked Dorothy. She must die, answered the princess. Nine times, inquired the scare scarecrow. As many times as is necessary, was the reply. I will ask the tin woodman to defend the prisoner, because he has such a kind heart. I am sure he will do his best to save her. And the woggle, woggle bug shall be the public accuser, because he is so learned that no one can deceive him. Who will be the jury? asked the tin woodman. There ought to be several animals on the jury, said Ozma, because animals understand each other better than we people understand them. So the jury shall consist of the cowardly lion, the hungry tiger, Jim the cab horse, the yellow hen, the sawhorse, the scarecrow, the wizard, Tick-Tock, and the machine man. That makes the nine which the law requires, and all my people shall be admitted to hear the testimony. They now separated to prepare for the sad ceremony, for whenever an appeal is made in to law, sorrow is almost certain to follow, even in a fairyland like Oz. But it must be stated that the people of the land were generally so well behaved that there was not a single lawyer amongst them, and it had been years since any ruler had sat in judgment upon an offender of the law, the crime of murder being the most dreadful crime of all. Tremendous excitement prevailed in the Emerald City when the news of Eureka's arrest and trial became known. The wizard, when he returned to his own room, was exceedingly thoughtful. He had no doubt that Eureka had eaten the piglet, but he realized that a kitten cannot be depended upon at all times to act properly, since its nature is to destroy small animals and even birds for food, and the tame cat that we keep in our houses today is descended from the wild cat of the jungle, a ferocious creature indeed. The wizard knew that if Dorothy's pet was found guilty and condemned to death, the little girl would be made very unhappy. So, although he grieved over the piglet's sad fate as much as any of them, he resolved to save Eureka. Sending for the tin woodman, the wizard took him into a corner and whispered, My friend, it is your duty to defend the white kitten and try to save her, but I fear you will fail because Eureka has long wished to eat a piglet. To my certain knowledge, and my opinion is that she has been unable to resist the temptation. Yet her disgrace and death would not bring back the piglet, but only serve to make Dorothy unhappy. So I intend to prove the kitten's innocence by a trick. He drew from his inside pocket one of the eight tiny piglets that were remaining and continued, This creature you must hide in some safe place, and if the jury decides that Eureka is guilty, you may then produce this piglet and claim that it is the one that was lost. All the piglets are exactly alike, so no one can dispute your word. This deception will save Eureka's life and then we may all be happy again. I do not like to deceive my friends, replied the tin woodman. Still, my kind heart urges me to save Eureka's life, and I can usually trust my heart to do the right thing. So I will do as you say, my friend wizard. After some thought, he placed the little pig inside his funnel-shaped hat, and then put the hat upon his head, and went back to his room to think over his speech to the jury. And that will end our reading for today. Tomorrow will be our last two chapters, so tune in and find out what happens to Eureka during the trial and if she's found guilty and where our friends all will end up at the end of the book. So until tomorrow, I hope you have a wonderful day.